All right, so um, if you would just grab your Bible real quick, and I just want to lift it up before the Lord and just to remind ourselves that the Word of God gives life. And this is our food. Jesus said he was the bread of life. He told the woman at the Samaritan well that the water that he could give us was living water. And do you believe that? That's the question. Do you believe it? Because if we do believe it, then we should be eating the word on a regular basis, and we should be drinking from that well of living water that Jesus offers us. And look, it's a challenge because not everything in the Bible is easy to understand or easy to know how to apply. But if we're with people that we trust, other Christians, if we're plugged into a body of believers where there's a life-giving spirit, then, then we can ask for advice from people who are mature and who know you know, who've crossed a lot of these bridges that we might be facing. Let's see, where am I? Thank you. I don't know if it's my Italian in me, but I, I like having that fan blowing on me when I'm speaking. I get hot fast. So what I put at the bottom of this cover page, it says the power of prophetic revelation. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today. There we go. And um, it's based on a verse in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Okay, that, that's a, an interpretation that I took specifically because it said prophetic vision. Other places say where there's no vision, the people perish. Okay, and, and that's one of the reasons too earlier today I had you pray over your eyesight and say, Lord, open my eyes to what you want me to do. Because in my experience in life, and I've still been working all these years that we've had the church, which is over 20 years now, that's the biggest thing that I find is missing is vision. Because without, you could have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't know how to apply that knowledge, if you don't have a, a goal that you're shooting for, then you could be wasting a lot of what you've been given because you don't know how to apply it. So that's really the, the cornerstone of what I want to talk about today, is what do we do about that? How can we stoke the fire of vision in our lives and ask the Lord to please open my eyes to what you want me to see? It's a constant theme throughout the Bible, and there's plenty of negative examples where People like King Saul, back in the Old Testament, was disobedient and acted in haste. And instead of waiting and just being obedient to what the Lord had showed him through Samuel the prophet, Samuel said, wait until I get here. Don't offer the sacrifice. Don't step out of your position. But what he saw with his eyes is Samuel hadn't gotten there yet. And what did he do? He panicked. And because he panicked, God gave him a very severe word. I'm yanking the kingdom out of your hands. Because that rebelliousness is like a sin of witchcraft. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. He said, I have found a man after my own heart. And he was talking about King David. So Saul lost that opportunity that he was given. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I am wanting to bring a, a sobering word that we have to take advantage of what he's showing us, when we're showing us, when he's showing, because if we miss it, it's not that he doesn't forgive us, but there's windows of opportunity and if we don't step through them, he's got to go get somebody else to step through them. And he will do that. And we'll look at that in the Word today. We don't want to be people that said, I miss my day of visitation. And that's another reason to ask him, open my eyes, Lord. I don't want to walk past all these opportunities. The New Testament is full of people that kept doing that. So the phrase he gave me a couple weeks ago was to be mission-minded and vision-driven. All right? So do you believe that you are a missionary for the Lord? Those of you that are here, humor me. Not, you're not humor me. You really believe it. Well, even if you don't have a clergy title, even if not formally uh, been designated as a missionary, all of us are called in the New Testament to be ministers of reconciliation. But it's so much more than that. Because living Christianity in a lukewarm way is almost worse than not doing it at all, is what God said. Either be hot or cold, but don't water down the word of God. This is the most powerful word that we have on the planet. So you can't give a watered down version of it. I want to be mission minded and I want to be vision driven because when I'm vision driven, I can get through the storms a lot easier. Remember, Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side and a terrible storm came. But if they had just held on, no, he's God. He told us we're getting to the other side. It doesn't matter what storm is going on. And Jesus said, you have little faith, right? When, when they woke him up, why didn't you trust? Because they didn't have a good enough vision in their mind. But when God drops a word in your heart, either audibly or a vision or a picture of what you're going to do, that helps you get through those tough times way better than anything else that I've found. Because if I know God said it, regardless of what's happening, I'm going to push through. Now, he can change 
the picture along the way, which he did with Abraham, right? Because he told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. And as Abraham was about to do it, God said, okay, you don't have to do it anymore. So we, another way that he had to be still listening and still alert because it's the proceeding word of God that we have to cultivate and we want to be able to hear his voice clearly. Wow, we don't want to go. If his presence isn't going with us, we don't want to go. Amen. So that's what we'll talk about today, opening our eyes. In verse, uh, it's the ESV version where I took the text verse where there is no prophetic vision. The people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. And obviously that's Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. But it's really more blessed is the one who's obedient to the calling that God placed on your life. And it's really good to do this. Just say this with me. I have a godly calling on my life. I don't, want to, I don't want to come short of anything that he gave me. You don't have to say that part. But, but just keep repeating that to yourself. I have a calling on my life, and it's different than anyone else. Those of you that go to our church, you know how different my wife and I are, right? We're you know, married 35 years, but very, very different temperaments and personality styles. So that can either cause a lot of fights or it can cause a lot of respect. I mean, probably was both for us in the beginning. But as, as we got to know each other and got to trust the other person's ability and see the redemptive part of the different part of them, i am like, wow, God, this is a gift that you gave me because she brings things that I don't have. And one puts 1,000, but two put 10,000 to flight. So when we worked together, and instead of grinding against each other over our differences, we saw the benefit of the other person's gift and said, oh, I'm going to stay in my lane because I don't have to intrude on her side because she's really good at that. And she doesn't have to intrude on my side because of things I'm good at. God put us together for a reason, that we could complement each other. And that's how it is in our walk with him here on the earth. I really believe every day is a mission for God in our lives. And there's no neutral ground, right? So if you're not going forward in the mission, you didn't stay neutral. You backed up, okay? And I know that's probably been used in a condemning way. I'm not trying to say it's a works mentality or you're trying to earn anything with God. I would just rather you think of it like a military analogy and think of the Navy SEALs, okay? They're the most elite, one of the most elite groups in all the military in all the world. And it's really hard to make it in to that group. Not only do you have to be smart and in good shape, you have to have an ability to never quit. And that's true for us too. Okay? We cannot quit. I, I told people that go to our church that I met a man named Marcus Luttrell, who is a Navy SEAL, and that he wrote the book called Lone Survivor. And I was with him for about an hour in the meeting, and Trisha was there with me, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room after an hour of him talking. And he believes in God. I wouldn't say he's probably a born-again Christian, but... He was giving glory to God for it, but there was something else that, that there was like an anointing on his life that when I shook his hand and spoke to him, I felt like I understood the courage that it took to do what they do, what the Navy SEALs do. He was on 300 deployments in the course of his time, and the only reason he stopped is because he was shot so many times and he had so many broken bones that his body wouldn't physically let him do it, but he wanted to go back, okay? Unbelievable. And when you read the story, which the book, by the way, is much, much better than the movie. The movie does not do it justice. There's a point in there that I've never forgotten. He said, what we learned at the SEALs, like if anybody on this team in that, that seven day they call Hell Week, where you have to stay up and work and operate for seven days, anybody that rings the bell, they're allowed to leave whenever they want. But if they ring the bell, that means they're quitting and they're leaving. We know that everybody who gets through that will never quit no matter what. And now he didn't know that he was going to be out in Afghanistan and it's going to be 150 of the enemy and he's the only lone survivor left. And any normal person reading this book is saying, why would you even keep trying to get away? You're dead to rights. They've got you. You're, he was shot in the butt. He couldn't walk. He's crawling on his elbows. And he knew if I, as we said multiple times that day, if we have one ounce of strength left, we keep on spending that one ounce because we never quit. That's knowing your identity. And the amazing part of the story is even as he's crawling and they're closing in on him because they all knew where he was, the, uh, one of the bombs that, that they were trying to hit him with blew up near him and blew him into the cleft of a rock. You can't make this up. And after the explosion, they couldn't see him. He could see out, but they couldn't see him. And I, I wouldn't have thought of that, would you? Like, you're thinking, how am I going to get out of this mess? 
You don't have to worry about the how. Just keep doing what he's asking you to do. And if you're mission-minded and vision-driven, you won't be distracted so much. But just remember that the vision changes because he loves us. He's a good father. We just sang it, right? Okay, good. I'm in Amos chapter 3. Trish quoted from Amos chapter 9 earlier. It says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? That happens in the natural, but it also happens in the spiritual, right? We talk a lot about alignment, who's your covering, who are you aligned with. If I had to ask somebody, let's say we wanted to do a missions trip and I had to ask for a pastoral reference for you, who would I write to? It's kind of a sobering question, isn't it? Some people are just kind of free agents out there and they really couldn't get a pastoral reference because they haven't found a place that they trust and where they can come underneath somebody's covering and be properly aligned. I'm not saying you can't do that, but it's really good to be properly aligned. How are, gonna, how are two going to walk together unless they're in agreement? And, and we want to be in agreement with the covering because we're not going to have all the answers. We feel very safe in the covering that we have with Chuck Pearson and, and the rest of the team that's there. And we can call him and ask for advice, and he calls us too. It's really a great two-way relationship. So we can't walk together unless we're agreed. And then I love the way he, he says it here. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? <laughs> all right, so it's just a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Okay, there's a reason why the lion roars. And then, then Amos says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his, uh, yeah, for, another version says, until he first reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Okay, can we just meditate on that for a minute? Like this is a beautiful gift that God is giving us. We all have different temperaments and different gift mixes. But the people that are strong in the prophetic, they serve an important role on the team. They're the watchmen. They're the ones that are out front, like, like a scout back in the old days when the army would send out a scout. Well, in the Bible too, right? Joshua and the 12 spies, they went in to look at the land. That's what the prophetic does. It's always cutting into the new and cutting into the future. And it doesn't even fully always understand what the specifics are. That's happened in this last year with Chuck Pierce, right? He was saying things that he saw in the spirit. He didn't specifically say coronavirus, but all the way around that he was saying from Passover, we're going to get through when we get to Pentecost. There's going to be a problem between March and April. He kept saying it, and we didn't know specifics what it was about. All right, so God does nothing unless he reveals to his, his secret to his servants, the prophets. And then he comes back and says, a lion has roared. So he's referring right back to verse 3 in the beginning. Who will fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Okay, so that means he's asking us all to operate in this kind of an anointing and, and living this way. We don't want to live with a, a dead book. We want to live with a living book. Yes, the, the word of God is alive and powerful, but if, we're, if there's no oil in our lives to cause it to come alive and to be interactive and in a life-giving relationship with God, it can kill people, right? The letter of the law kills. So if we use it to beat people over the head with fear, that's a problem. If we use the word of God in conjunction with Holy Spirit, who we've been given, to speak words of life, then people get born again because we know what to say. We prophetically, in every conversation, in every engagement in our jobs, even when people are giving us a hard time, we can talk to them in a way that God has anointed in our lives. Over and over the Bible, it says, if you open your mouth, I will fill it. Right? That means with his word, but even with food. Even if we're struggling financially, that means he's feeding us. Open your mouth and I will fill it. Like the little bird in the nest looking up to the father. Giving the food. It's probably the mother. The mothers usually are the ones bringing the food for the birds. All right, the next one says in uh, John 14, 26, when the father, this is, all right, I'll just set it up for you. Jesus, this, chapter 13 was when he washed the disciples' feet, 14, uh, in John 14, 15, 16, you know that that's the prayer to the father, right? It's right before his ascension. And they were confused because they wanted to know where he was going and can we go with you? And he said, no, it's actually good that I go because if I go, I can send who? The comforter. No, Dan, I want you to answer. I'm talking to you, man. It's good. The comforter. But if you look it up in Bible Hub and you look up that verse, there's about eight different names for the Holy Spirit in all the different translations. The advocate, the comforter, paraclete. Some of you have heard that word like an attorney would be. There's so many descriptions and translations into English because the Holy Spirit has so many different roles. It's awesome. 
And he said, when the Father sends the spirit of holiness, this is in the Passion Translation, he says, the one like me who sets you free will teach you all things. That's another name for Holy Spirit, the one like Jesus who sets us free. I love that name. Thank you, Brian Simmons. Romans 8 says in verse 18, the sufferings that we endure now are not even worth comparing to the glory that is coming and will be revealed in us. What do you think is going to be revealed in us as Christians? Let's assume you live a life that's honorable to God, and, and when your day comes, you die, and you go to heaven. What does that life look like to you? Have you thought much about the glory that will be revealed in us? Because if all we're doing is spending time in heaven with other people that are in heaven, how will he reveal his glory to them? See, there's more to the story. The glory in Romans 8 that he's talking about is when we rule and reign with Christ at his second return. When he comes back, the story's not over when we die and go to heaven, okay? He's coming back, and we're coming back with him, and we're going to rule and reign with him. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. That's what our vision should be. Because if, if my mission is to complete this life as training for reigning in the future life, then my vision is very different than just trying to get by. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says we're just supposed to just get by. Now, we might not be great at the things we try to do, but most of you, if you're parents, you know when you're training your children, you've got to let them try a lot of different things. And you help them find the things they're good at, and you help them find the things they're not so good at. And unfortunately, when they first started doing that show, um, America's Got Talent, man, like some of those people that were coming for the tryouts, it was kind of cruel, wasn't it? Like, that's actually what they used to show on the advertising, that people thought they could sing, and then they would mock them and make fun of them because whoever told them that they should try out probably was pulling a joke on them, right? So just because you think you're good at something, that's not necessarily the end of the story, is it? You want to see where the fruit is coming in your life, and you want to sift through all the things you're not good at, and there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm not good at everything, because nobody is, all right? Let's be honest. So find your strength. And don't let somebody else try to put Saul's armor on you and give you a fake identity. No, I want the Father to tell me. Yes, the Christians around me are going to help me in that area, but I just think that's a big part of what we should be shooting for. What is my mission? And what is the vision God's given me to help complete that mission? I, I'm a father, so I know I'm constantly talking to my sons and talking to them about what they're doing, where, that le where that's leading them compared to what we talked about last year and the year before. And all the way, to as, even as little children, I was trying to help them understand this. You don't have to worry about that. That's not what you're going to end up doing. But this, look at how you're flourishing in this area. Look at how the teachers are talking about how excited you are when we talk about this subject in school. Tons of examples like that. And similarly to Romans 8, 18, is 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. And, and it's been really a, a verse I've reflected on a lot since this COVID uh, virus started. Because it says this momentary light suffering. Can you say that? Momentary light suffering. And now he wasn't specifically talking about the coronavirus, okay? And I know there's real suffering going on, so I'm not meaning to minimize that at all. But in light of what we will have, at the second coming, the ruling and reigning with Christ for eternity. Nothing that we face here compares to the glory that we're going to receive. He gives us tools to, to get through the difficult times. He doesn't say we're going to be spared the difficult times. But if you keep your mind stayed on Jesus, that's what, that's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 26. I will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on me. The Lord says that. So this light and momentary suffering or affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Wow. Think about that. It's not all going to waste. As you are developing your character, character gets developed through suffering just like it does through other things too. You become stronger on the other side. It's not that it's fun to go through it. But I can see a redemptive purpose even in the tough things that I have to walk through. He's not... He said to his father when he prayed for us, Jesus did, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm asking you to help them avoid the evil of the world and to be able to walk through it and keep shining my light. And I'm saying there's a direct correlation between how well you will function as a Christian and how clearly you understand your mission and the vision God gave you to complete it. So even this place that we're standing in today, this was a vision for me to be here because we knew we had made a decision as a church 
to leave the building that we were in. The lease was going to be coming up, and, and we knew that we didn't want to spend the amount of money we'd have to spend to keep that going. But that didn't mean we knew where we were going, right? So the Lord, you pray, and you ask the Lord, and he shows you different things, and it's not a wild goose chase, okay? Like, I went to some places that we didn't end up going, but that's part of the process. It's what you do. And then even when you get there, you pray about it. You don't make quick decisions. You get counsel. You ask people about it. And not everybody has the same vision, right? So you have to be patient with people when you go and tell them, oh, it's a no-brainer. We'll do this, this, and this. And they're looking at you like, what planet did you just land from? They can't see it yet. And you got to work with them. You have to help them understand and try to put yourself in their place because they care about you. They love you. They just don't see it yet. So give them a little time to work through that and that. That happens pretty much everything we do. I remember when we opened up the cafe, that was really hard for people to picture what it might look like. And the first house we bought was worse than a handyman special. And Trisha's like, are you kidding me? You must have given me the wrong address. You can't think I'm going to want to live in this house. And, and I could see it, but I hadn't let her catch up with the thing that I could see. So don't. that's not a bad thing. God wants us to flourish in us. He, he constantly wants to be shown, just like any good parent would want to show their children, the specifics. So that's suffering is producing an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. I'm going to talk about that more on Tuesday night so we can skip to the next one. Oh, I love this part of the Bible. It's, all, it's 2 Kings chapter 2, and it's two prophets with similar names. Elijah is the senior, and Elisha is his apprentice who's underneath him, his student. And the older, Elijah said to the student, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But if you know the story, you know he's this, this student, this apprentice. Elisha is saying, uh-uh, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to leave me behind. I'm not leaving you. That's what a good apprentice does, right? That's who we are with the Lord. We just, we're locking in. We're going to be like a bulldog, and we're locking on to you, Lord. And he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Say that. I will not leave you. You're talking to the Lord now. And Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, and the water was divided this way and that. So the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Say that too. I'm crossing over on dry ground. And verse 9 says, so it was when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? So what if Elisha had just listened the first time and left? Let Elisha leave and say, oh, well, he told me I shouldn't go with him. Like, no, no, you don't get it. I'm not leaving. I'm staying with you. That allowed him to be close enough that Elisha said, okay, ask. What is it that you want me to do for you before I go? Elisha said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What would you say if God said, ask? Would you be that ready and that quick with an answer? I think part of it is because Elisha had been dwelling on this already. He knew he was mission-minded. He had a vision, and he was dwelling on it so that when the opportunity came, he had the answer right there. I don't think he delayed on this because you could probably get a sense that Elijah knew he was going to be taken up. So you better ask quick, what do you want, Easter, before I go? And he said, boom, double portion. Verse 10. You've asked a hard thing, Elijah said. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. Wow, see, if you see me, if you see me when I'm taken, if we're in the same realm, if you've developed your understanding and your spiritual vision enough, if you see me because you've been with me and you've been loyal to me, then you'll get what you asked for. And then it happened, verse 11. As they continued on and talked, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared. Woo! With horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up. By a whirlwind into heaven. And verse 12 says what? Elisha. Can't see it yet. There it is on the bottom. Elisha saw it. And he cried out. My father, my father. The chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he knew he was going to get the double portion. Because he could see it. And there's a lesson for us, right? What are you looking at? What do you see? Are you asking the Lord, drop a new picture in my spirit because a picture's worth a thousand words, right? The Lord will give you a video. If a picture's worth a thousand words, what's a video worth? More than a thousand, I promise you that. I called somebody this week and said, the Lord gave me a picture for you. Can we talk about it? He's like, yes. You know, it was almost like, wow, really? Like God cares that much about me that he would give you a picture? And you don't say that lightly, do you? 
you're going to make sure that it was really the Lord talking to you. And I can't wait to tell him what the picture was. Elijah saw it. He cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. And he sees Elijah disappear. Verse 12. So he saw him no more. Elijah is left by himself. He took hold of his own clothes. And what did he do? I'm waiting to see if you guys are keeping up with me. Why did he tear his own clothes into two pieces? Because he had been given the mantle of Elijah. Another thing to remember here, right? The old way has to stay in the last season because you're coming into a new wineskin. New wine needs a new wineskin, right? So maybe you're still trying, and Chuck talks about this quite a bit, that we're not just going into a new season. It's a whole new era. We're going more into the kingdom era than the church era was. We have to think more on a regional basis than we have in the past. That's just a recent quote, right? So he tore those old clothes off because that was his old identity. He now has a double portion. So the old stuff's got to go. I'm taking on the identity God gives me. Verse 13, he also took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen, struck the water, and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? That's faith. His heart was giving him a direction, and he acted it out by faith, and he touched the river just like his father in the Lord, Elijah, had done. And when he struck the water, what happened? It divided, and he did what? And we're crossing over. <laughs> so I'm going to take in a different place now and finish in this area. Because this is really the way the Lord ministered to me the most this week. Because, you know, when, when he gives you a picture and you dwell on it, he unpacks it even more. And this idea of being mission-minded and vision-driven has been kind of the underlying theme that he's been giving me. And, and I'm not the, uh, the only one who's ever thought about these things. And... If you've studied the Bible, you know that there's a lot of disappointments in the Old Testament. Adam and Eve, we'll start right there in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. What was the mission they were given? It says it there if you want to look in Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden, and he wanted them to tend it and to keep it, right? And did they fail or did they succeed? So they failed in their assignment, right? Have you ever failed in one of your assignments? Yes. Yes. We're human beings. We make mistakes. We have that sin, sin nature in us. But that's not God's plan. If he gives us the assignment, he makes a way for us to do it. If, if he's given us a mission, he's not mean. He wouldn't ask us to do something and not give us the tools. So it's not condemning, but it's hard to build a kingdom around a failing model, isn't it? So if Adam and Eve were going to sin, they failed in their assignment. Then God came and made covenant with Abraham many chapters later, didn't he? And he said, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. This is Isaiah speaking prophetically about the Jewish covenant, about what God did with Abraham and his children. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, Isaiah 49.6. A light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay, now there's a whole lot more theology behind all of what I'm talking about. We could go in a lot of different directions, but just take it on faith that that was part of their mission was to be a light to the whole world. And what had happened by the time Jesus came is they were not a light to the Gentiles, were they? They had kind of taken the gift that God meant for the whole world, and they were using it just for themselves. And they weren't trying to evangelize or help the poor. In fact, they had a disdain for the poor. There's one scene in Luke 15, right? It says that Jesus... And the Pharisees were both at the same location, and the tax collectors and the sinners were drawn to Jesus. And I would say that we could, by deduction, say that they were repelled by the Pharisees because the Pharisees looked down on the poor, and Jesus welcomed the poor. So who are we supposed to be? Clearly, Jesus is our model. So in many ways, you could say that the Jews did not complete the mission that God gave them. They did not complete the assignment of being a light unto the world. So what does God do? He sends his son. And if Adam wasn't going to do it right, and if Abraham's children weren't going to do it right, he's going to get somebody who will do it right. And that's why I want to just stoke up your intents a little bit here, because as the months and years go by, if we're missing a lot of opportunities, we better be careful, because we don't want to miss our moment of visitation, right? That's another Bible word. And verse in, uh, uh, sorry, Paul unpacks this in Romans 3. He says the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. 
in other places it says the oracles of God. But the whole revelation of God is that I'm real. Uh, at that time, most other uh, of the tribes that were a part of Abraham's children, they, they worshiped multiple gods. And the Jews were different because they were serving one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, all the other cultures had multiple thousands of gods, right? And Zeus, and you can find all this in, in the book of Acts, the different people that they worshiped. Diana, uh, just over and over, just idolatry everywhere. They were different, but instead of opening the door to the Gentiles, they had become shelter to themselves. And they kept the gift God gave them to give everybody, they kept it to themselves. He doesn't like that, does he? We better not. All right, it says the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. Some of them were unfaithful. But just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? I hope you know the answer. A little louder. No, I've been preaching to an empty room for a long time, so it's really good to have some live people. So don't be afraid to respond. God will not be unfaithful. Of course not. So just because they failed to be a light to the Gentiles, and again, this is just really uh, kind of sobering language, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he's talking about when Rome is going to come in in A.D. 70 and destroy Jerusalem. He's prophesying to them in advance what will happen in Luke 19. The enemy will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Oh, you missed the day of your visitation. Then Jesus entered the temple, began to drive out the people selling the animals for sacrifices. He said to them, I'm going to interpret it. This isn't the mission the Father gave you, was to be out here selling and, and, and really gouging people at high prices because they did, couldn't afford to bring it with them. No, no. The scriptures declare my temple would be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. That could happen to any of us, that we could get off track and take the calling that God gave us and use it for our own exploits. And he's saying, no, you can't do that. I want you to stay true. And that's why if you keep the vision that he gives you clearly in your mind, it's much harder to drift from it because you know, like his, it says his mind, his eyes were set like flint. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem because that's my mission. And I have a clear picture on my mind how to get there. And then he taught daily in the temple. But the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law, and the other leaders of the people, what? Began planning how to... Can't read it there? Okay, I got the same version. Whew. The very God that they serve was in their midst, and they missed it because of religion. They missed their day of visitation. So that's part of the warning today. It's like, wow, really? Who would I have been back then? Which one would I have been? Would I have recognized that he really was Jesus or would I would have been wanting to kill him because I was so worried about my own power base and feeling threatened by this guy? Oh, that's something definitely worth thinking about. And what about today? What is my mission? What is my vision? If you are one of the people that has more time on your hands now, this would be a good thing to be journaling out. What, what are the prophetic words that I've been given over the course of my Christian life? What are some of the themes that keep popping up that people keep saying that you might remember, right? That they, time and time again, like my wife got convicted because several people told her she should write, and she did. She wrote a book, and she's got another one that she'll be working on. But, you know, without those prophetic words, you just kind of, ah, maybe down the road. No, there's a sense of urgency. God's sending people and telling you this is what he wants you to do. So you have to be sober about that, right? All right, almost done. We talk about Adam and Eve in the garden did not complete their mission. Abraham and his children started out well, but did not complete their mission. They were not a light to the world. So who was faithful to his commission? Jesus. I'll give you easy answers. <laughs> Anything to get you to talk back at me a little bit. <laughs> we say in our church, if they ask a question from the pulpit, if you say Jesus, you'll be right 50% of the time anyway. So Romans 3.21. Now, quite apart from the law, this is Paul talking, an expert on the law, and, and he, he had to do such a transformation in his brain, having been a Pharisee himself, to say, you know what, something new's going on. We're in a new era. We're in a new dispensation. Because apart from the law, God's covenant justice comes into operation. How? Through the faithfulness of Jesus the Messiah. So Adam and Eve were not faithful. 
Abraham and his children were not faithful to the covenant. But who was? You're right again. Amazing. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> if anybody was ever mission-minded and vision-focused, it was our Lord. So if he's setting the example for us, that's a real good sign to just lock down and ask people that you trust and that you love, what do you see in me? And as we're talking to people, we should be speaking over them what we see in them if we're in a position to have that kind of authority and respect in their lives. What do you see? I want to know what God has for me. I don't want to waste time on things that are, that are not his plan. And I won't be manipulated by people that want to use me for something that's not God's plan either, right? So Hebrews 12, 2 says, Jesus' heart was focused. So there you go, right? If you're focused, and his heart was focused on something, he was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. Talk about perfect in all your ways. Good, good father. He was focused on the joy, not focused on the pain of the cross. The, the, the crucifixion was a brutal way to die. He could have been focused on that and living in fear. No. He was focused, it says it in the Passion Translation, his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. That's who we serve. Jesus did not fail on his mission. He said, it is finished. That's the last thing he said. I completed the mission. I was faithful to the Father. And I just want you to connect this in with another portion of Scripture that, that's not so always easy to understand. And then, and then we'll finish there, okay? It says in Romans 3.22, God's covenant justice comes into operation through the faithfulness of Jesus the Messiah. All right? Got it? They were unfaithful. He was faithful. We're not coming in behind them. We're coming in behind him. So we have a faithful Savior, and if we want to be true to his character in our lives, that's a good way to measure how well we're doing. It's difficult, isn't it, when, when you let, I'm just going to use a, an easy example for a minute, I think, and even though it's a little sensitive example, is about food. Okay, let's just say you went to your doctor, and the doctor said, I'm this, not negative speaking over anybody, but just say, you, you need to lose 20 pounds. And if you don't lose 20 pounds, I'm going to have to put you on medication. Nobody would want to go on medication, right? Because it's never cheap. <laughs> but that's not the right reason. It's because you want to be healthy, right? So if he said, and I'm going to meet you in 60 days, and, and if you haven't lost the weight yet, then I'm going to have to put you on the medication. And by the way, 60 days after that, every time, every time you're in here, I'm going to keep checking. And if you don't keep it off, then you're going to have to go on the medication. And you don't want to go on the medication, right? Well, a crash diet isn't going to work, is it? Everybody here tried those? Yeah. Cottage cheese and grapefruit? <laughs> doesn't work. Why? Because you're just trying to do a quick fix. You have to change the deep ingrained habits in your life. And only God can do that for you, right? It's not our willpower. It never will be willpower. <laughs> you got to ask God to help you. So show me where I'm going wrong on this because I keep trying, but it's not working. And again, I'm not saying this to condemn anybody. But what I hear people say is, I don't want to weigh myself. <laughs> okay, well, here's it. here we go, though, right? Because if you're not even going to weigh yourself, how else are you going to know if you're on track to complete the mission, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, well, you know, you should probably shouldn't do worry about every single day, but what's the trend from week to week? If I have a target that I have to lose 20 pounds in two months, I better get going. And the way I know is because I get on a scale, and that's what this is. All right? This is a way to measure. Not, not if we use it like a, a cannon, but the combo of the Word of God and what's going on in my life is how I know whether I'm being true to the mission that God gave me. So I hope you don't feel condemned by that. But he was faithful. We're his disciples. We can be faithful to the calling that God places on us. And health is a good one. If we really want to be the most effective ministers, right, the Navy SEALs aren't allowed to be overweight, right? You could be booted out, but that could be your calling. So we want to take really good care of our bodies because we'll be more effective at what he gives us instead of being shamed into doing it, right? It's just all about our motive. I'm going to get off that subject. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. There's no distinction. All sin, right? 
This is right after that. This is Romans 3. It said, first of all, Jesus was faithful. And now it says, I'm going to read it again. God's covenant justice comes into operation through the faithfulness of Jesus the Messiah. For the benefit of all who are Jews. Is that what it says? Somebody talk back at me. For all who have, thank you, Marissa. She could see it right in front of her. It's right there. It's an open book test. <laughs> it's an important point, though. That was part of the thing Paul had to get out of his head was that only the Jew, this was only for the Jews. Or it's only by living up to the law could you be faithful to God. No, it's by faith. You're saved by faith. You're justified by faith and faith alone. So when Paul confronts Peter in the book of Acts and says, what are you doing? You got up from the table because you were with Gentiles. That's the old way of doing it. We don't do that anymore. And Peter was a strong guy in the church, so Paul had to have some courage, right? But he was right to confront that because Peter had slipped back into that old way of thinking. That's not your mission, Peter. We are called to bring the Gentiles in. Look, that was a hard thing for them to grasp. Remember when Peter had the vision? Oh, I would never kill and eat, Lord. I've always followed the law. And God said, listen, I'm bringing you into a new era. I said kill and eat. So if I called it clean, it's clean. And any of us here who are not born of the covenant, we're very grateful that God opened the kingdom up for us Gentile, pagan, barbarian people that we are. <laughs> Where? Sorry. Thank you, Trish. 35 years. I know the voice of my wife. <laughs> by God's grace. Oh, wait a minute. It's all of sin, but by God's grace, they are freely declared to be in the right. So if you're watching this and this is somewhat new to you, you could be saying, yeah, but if he knew the mistakes I made, that's not what this says. If you have faith to believe, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead, you can have that same salvation regardless of how bad your track record was prior. He's not going to approve of you continuing to sin. You have to change, but you'll want to change because you'll be filled with the spirit of holiness from God. And just like Jesus said, the same spirit that I had to make you free that was in me is now available to you through the Holy Spirit. It's by God's grace. That's all it is. It's a gift freely given. You can't earn it. You're declared to be in the right to be members of the covenant through the redemption, which is found in the Messiah Jesus. Almost done. Oh, I love this one. This is called the New English Translation. It's a solid translation. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Did anybody have a hard time understanding that when you first read it as a new Christian? Because I did. I go, what does that mean? I was crucified with Christ, but I still live? I didn't understand that my old nature had to die. It wasn't my physical body that was dying. My old nature, that sinful nature, had to die. And if I let it, it would resurrect back up. Because if I was around a lot of temptation, I could feel the pull of that old lifestyle trying to bring me back in. But he's saying, Paul, this is the first verse that the Navigator's ministry asked people to memorize. Right? They have a whole big list of memory verses. This is number one. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, say it with me if you know it. I live by, nobody knows it. Some verses say the faith of the Son of God. Others say the faith in the Son of God. I'm just trying to get you to see this one. It says, the life that I now live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God. Do you see the difference? It's not so hard to understand anymore. I didn't earn this. Adam and Eve didn't get the job done. Abraham and his descendants didn't get the job done. Jesus got the job done. The life that I now live here in this flesh only is available to me because Jesus was faithful to the covenant promise that he made with the Father. He went to the cross, and it says, for the joy that was set before him, that you would be his. So how could I not want to serve that God that loved me so much that instead of focusing on the pain of the cross, he focused on the joy of knowing that we would be in his family. And you'll notice that Christians will often call each other brother and sister. There's a reason for that. Because God calls himself Father. Not angry judge. Good Father. Perfect in all his ways. A loving Father, an affectionate Father. Abba, Daddy. 
Father, not angry judge. I was with somebody this week, and he said, I'd never heard that before. It's the first time I ever heard that as much as I love my kids is how much God loves me. And he stopped talking, and he got teared up a little bit. I was like, how come I didn't know that? It was the wrong picture of God. It, it was the angry judging part. No, he's a good father. Abba, that means daddy. Look what Acts 2 says. 2.22, that should be easy to remember. This is from the Passion. Jesus, the victorious, was a man on a divine mission. <laughs> All right? That clear enough for you? He was here for a reason. You are here for a reason. I am here for a reason. Not the ultimate thing that we'll do when we come back with him, but we are training for reigning. So we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. So whatever you're doing in this life is going to count or not count towards that rule. Whatever we're doing then is going to be redemptive purpose of God. So when we're involved with the redemptive purposes of God in this life, then that's going to count for eternity. I can prove it if you need me to. He was a man on a divine mission. I am a man on a divine mission. You say that about yourself. I am a woman, man, whatever you are. A man or a woman on a divine mission. I, I, you don't have to repeat. I'm going to just complete the mission that God gives me. And I have to press in to find out what that is. Because you know the devil does not want you to know about your mission. He wants to keep you caught up in drugs and all kinds of deception and, and just destructive behavior patterns. But man, God is the God who sets us free. You know how he performed signs. This is Peter talking, and this is the last portion of scripture I'm going to. It's in the book of Acts. And it's all earlier in this chapter. The Holy Spirit fell, and there were people there that had been studying this Bible their whole lives the religious people, and they didn't know what was going on. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the religious people said, oh, that can't be God. You people are drunk 9 o'clock in the morning. And here's this fisherman from Galilee, Peter, who didn't have any of that formal education. He says, they're not drunk. This is what the prophet Joel wrote about. In the last days, God says. Now, how come Peter knew it and they didn't? Because they didn't want to see it. Because they were such, I'm going to say racist, really, in a lot of ways. Because they didn't want the poor people coming in. They thought they were better than other people. And they didn't want the, the broken people coming in. I was one of those broken people. So I'm sure glad Jesus loved me more than the religious people did. Right? But don't miss your day of visitation. They're standing there, and they're seeing a completely different thing than what God had intended. He poured out His Spirit so that this would be available for all of us. Remember, we read it in Isaiah. They were supposed to be the light to the Gentiles, but they had failed in that mission. Now Jesus came and said, this is what God wants you to do all the time. Reach out to the broken, because you were broken. You were a slave in Egypt, Israel. Don't forget the people that are hurting, and they did. So Peter's saying, Jesus, the victorious, was a man on a mission. He's talking to the people that had just killed Jesus. His authority was clearly proven. You know how he performed many powerful signs and wonders through him. This man's destiny was prearranged, for God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you. Can I just stop for one second there? This is like a confusing topic to people, predestination and all. Just be careful you don't get all caught up in that confusion. It's not. What, what, what God has always been meaning to say there is that you have a plan for your life. God has a divine, inspired plan. That's what the predestination is alluding to. That when you were in your mother's womb being formed, God put a blueprint together. This is the will of God for your life. This is the will of the devil for your life. God wants you to succeed and prosper and live abundantly. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Who's going to win? There's a contending for your altar of your life. You're either going to fulfill the calling God put on you or not. And I don't want anything but this one. I want the choice that he gave me. That's all he means there. Jesus' destiny was prearranged. And yet, you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet even that was a part of God's plan, he's saying. Verse 24, God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. David prophesied of the Messiah's resurrection. God revealed to him that Messiah would not be abandoned to the realm of death. And then he says in verse 32, can't you see it? Back to the vision again. A mission-minded, 
I'm vision driven. Can't you see it? This is a fisherman from Galilee talking to these educated people. Can't you see it? God resurrected Jesus and we've all seen him. Then God exalted him to his right hand on the throne of the highest honor. And the Father gave him the authority to send promise, the promised Holy Spirit, which is being poured out on us today. It's coming full circle. As part of that mission, he was going to do miracles, but now he releases the Spirit so that we can see miracles done through our lives. Oh, thank you, Lord. What, what a Savior. What a Jesus that we serve. I love you so much, I'll leave and send my spirit so you can all have it. And you can grow into who I called you to be, not who the world wants you to be. Oh, verse 37 says, when they heard this, they were crushed. And they realized what they had done to Jesus. They were deeply moved, and they said to Peter and the other disciples, what do we need to do? And that might be you. You might be saying, what do I need to do? This is news to me. I don't know any about this stuff. Nobody ever told me about the gospel of Jesus and about the fact that he died for my sins. I've seen those people holding up the signs at the football games. John 3, 16. I didn't know what it meant. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who would ever believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And in Romans 3, I'm sorry, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, Jesus is Lord. You will be saved. Romans 3 says, if the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. See it? Oh, man. The wages of sin causes death, but the gift of God gives you eternal life. And that's what he's offering you here. And that's what Peter said. He said, look, here's what you need to do in verse 38. Repent and return to God. And each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed. Do you believe you can have your sins removed? You ever been in court and your record been expunged? Isn't that amazing? What a cool word, expunged. Like it never happened. There's no more record. You did it, but it's not there anymore. You got expunged. I love that word. Because that's similar to what Jesus did. It's not that you didn't do it. You've been forgiven. And the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. So we're many times the ones that bring it up in our mind thinking, I lived a bad life. God forgot it. He forgave you and he forgot it. Oh, repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed. Then you may take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. For God's promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your families, for those yet to be born, and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Who is everyone that God has called to himself? Everyone. Okay? So that was verse 39, but in verse 21 that I didn't read, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. In another portion it says, he doesn't want one person to perish. That's who you're praying for. That's kids that are wayward kids. Your boss, it doesn't matter. Much as you might want to see them suffer, God does not want to see them suffer. And I'm just kidding. I know you don't want to see them suffer. But in our flesh, that gets tempting sometimes, doesn't it? No, he wants every person saved. It's not his will that even one person would perish. So do me a favor, you guys. Let's pretend there's a lot more of us here. And let's stand, OK? Because I just want to close with a prayer for anybody who might be watching who doesn't know. And if you are watching and you do know the Lord and you know somebody who could benefit from this, just send them the link to the video. It's so easy, right? Just let them know that they don't have to be living hijacked and tormented by fear from this coronavirus or any other way. Addictions are just destroying people's lives. God sets the captive free through his son, Jesus Christ through Holy Spirit. So what we'll do, these folks here with me will cooperate and say the prayer out loud with me. And we're just going to lead you in a prayer because that's, that's the way into the kingdom. It says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to confess with our mouth. Like, man, I tried it my way and my way is not working. So I got to try something different. I heard something today. What do I have to lose except a bunch of torment and sin? We 
we would tell you, that every one of us here, that we thought that when we got saved too. And God met us right where we were at. And he made himself so real in the days and the weeks following after we said yes that we knew it had to be real because there was no way those things could have been happening. So we're believing that for you right now. So that's all we're doing is just saying a prayer and asking the Lord to come into our lives. So I say it this way. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I learned something today that there's sin in my life that can be forgiven. I can't save myself, but I have a Savior who came and took the punishment that I deserved. That's hard for me to grasp. But by faith, I accept that you love me enough to go to a cross and die on my behalf to take the punishment that I deserved. Please accept me and adopt me into your family. I want to be loved by a loving father, not by an angry judge. I want to be part of the family of God. Please send your power through your Holy Spirit and your wisdom through the Word of God that I could live my life as your disciple, as your son, as a member of your kingdom in this life and for eternity. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior come into my life. Thank you, Jesus. Say amen. So Lord, we just pray for anybody who said yes to that prayer today. We thank you that you're no respecter. It doesn't matter who the person is. It doesn't matter what their background is. And we just pray that the seed of the word of God will fall on good ground into their hearts, that the enemy's not going to come and steal that seed, but that they're going to walk in the high places with you. We set our eyes and we look up because that's where our help comes from. It comes, it comes from the Lord. And we would love to talk to you. If you can email us, you can find us online. Call, call the church office. There's a bunch of ways to reach us just so you don't try to do this alone. So many people are stuck alone right now. That's not God's plan. Let the body of Christ come alongside and help and, and, and bring you along and show you how to launch into this new life, which nothing could be better. Well, we're going to end it now. So we just want to bless you before we sign off and just say like that song that we've been singing lately, lately, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and cause you to prosper in everything that you put your hand to. In Jesus' name, have a great, awesome day.